Hey everybody, welcome to uh, episode number 26, Social Selling for Newbies. The band is back nice, together. Nice. We have Carson with us today. So welcome back, Carson. Good, Good to, be to have, you, have you back. Thanks for holding down the fort. See, I always like to keep people guessing if I can make it or not. Um, <laughs> I like to joke I'm the I'm the Luke Perry or Heather Locklear, <laughs> the longest running guest star of uh, social selling. <laughs> We, we like always it. know you're going to make a grand entrance, whether it's, you know, a minute before, or a minute after it, you know. Well, we always knew you were the star. We just didn't think of you as being the guest star. I'm a guest. Yeah. yeah. Special guest. All right. Well, I tried to hold the fort on the uh, dad joke chat GBT. I think I did well last week, <laughs> despite what anybody else said. Um, so first of all, welcome anybody uh, online. Um, please certainly jump in, say hi, say you're here. And of course, welcome to the podcast listeners that continue to grow every week. So we have a pretty cool topic today about <clears throat> why traditional sales models have become a bit broken, which we're going to get into. And obviously, it sets the stage why so social selling is a, a very good alternative. But before we do that, who wants to go first? I think ChatGPT goes first today. That's fair. That's fair. So we'll let ChatGPT go first. I asked ChatGPT to provide a uh, dad joke to kick off our podcast today. And here it is. Why did the tomato turn red? Because it saw the salad dressing. <laughs> oh, Brandon, you're up. Oh, that's and, and if you're, this is your first time. So we need you to put in the, uh, the comments in the chat. Who wins between chat GPT dad joke and Brandon? Yeah. So, so hi, Brian. Hi, Butch. Good to hear. Yeah. But uh, that's man, that's good. That's tough. Brandon, you ready? You want to go check something else out or are you ready? To go? <clears throat> you know, I think I'm going with the one I have prepared. It kind right. of fits. Okay. Right. You ready? Okay. Uh, what do you call someone? And this might not be totally suitable for podcasts and LinkedIn, but I'm going to do it anyway. What do you call someone who refuses to fart in public? A private tutor. Oh, that's not bad. It's not bad. <laughs> that's not bad. You see, that's, a, that's, that's good for kids. That's yeah. a great one for kids. Yeah. I, in fact, I'll bet you that one would make my kids laugh. I My dad jokes rarely get a laugh. So, I mean, All right. uh, Brian joined. Yeah. So we're going to. Oh, well done, Brian. What did the baby corn say to the mama corn? Where's popcorn? <laughs> that's popcorn. good. I. <laughs> Brian wins, in my opinion. Yeah, Brian, yeah, Brian you win for sure. <laughs> oh, like all it. All right, this is getting out of hand already, so we better get back to things here. But uh, all right, so Brian's the winner today. Um, Good job, Brian. And and we have uh, tied for second is Chat P G Chat GPT and Brandon. So there you go. All right. Hey, thanks, Butch, for uh, giving me that one. He does, Somebody's Butch gives, on my side. Butch always gives it to you every week. I think. Are you paying Butch, or what's the deal? You know, somebody's got to pay for me to win every now and then. Come on. Okay. All right. So let's talk a bit about why traditional sales models are maybe more than a bit broken. And one of the reasons we want to do this show today is we continually, continually hear from people that, well, how much in time does social selling take? Or why, you know, how much of my of my, why should I be doing social selling? We've had other episodes on that and everything like that. My question and our question that we tend to ask all the time was, well, what else are you doing? Well, we're doing what our traditional playbooks are, our traditional sales motions are. And almost one for one, we ask the question, is it working? And almost one for one, we hear not very well, right? But what we thought we would do is kind of break, rather than making it a general statement of, it just doesn't work or it's broken. What is it that is an alternative to what you're doing with social? Let's look at the pros and the cons of it. And, you know, definitely hear from people that are for out there that if you're doing these types of things, and we even had some interesting stats, I think, to share along the way with that. So <clears throat> with that, the way we were going to start is, you know, we kind of looked at there's kind of three categories of sales motions, if you will that are more traditional, that most companies follow in the B2B space. One, I'm going to call, first of all, just the lead gen model. And the idea being, right, is that you have a lead magnet 
or something that you can download in exchange for your email. And then immediately after you download something from your email, there's either a, a SDR or a BDR or a salesperson that immediately follows up and tries to get a meeting, right? A meeting for a demo or a discovery call or whatever those, those types would be. Okay, so I'm gonna call that the lead gen model where there's a lead magnet and we'll talk about that. The second model is, I'm gonna call it the cold outreach model where you basically have a list or maybe you go on and to, to Zoom info or someplace like that and you get a list or you buy a list and you got a list of candidates and then you start cold calling or cold emailing or whatever the case may be. And again, the goal is to get somebody to pick up and be willing to have a meeting or a phone call or a demo or whatever the case may be. And then the third category, which is, I guess, to a degree, a subset of, of number one, but it's the whole inbound where you're using either pay-per-click, search, or SEO as you're trying to find and get people that are searching for you know things that may show intent. Like if I'm trying to buy a CRM tool, I'm looking for people that are that are look, searching for CRM or ERP or whatever it is that they may be doing. And then we're trying to get them and, and, and capture those people because they're showing some intent and then obviously again, turn them into a meeting. Now you could argue that's to some degree a subset of number one with the lead gen model, but I'm gonna call it a separate one because it tends to be more focused on intent and somebody who seems to be in market. So those are kind of the three, what do you guys think? Do you think that represents the kind of three buckets pretty well? I do. Yeah, I think it's a good summary. Yeah, I do. And I would even take this one slight step further too, Tom, because I think you, you hit on some really important things. Like let's call out the landscape, right? You know, consumers are more informed uh, than they've ever been. Um, and there are also a lot of these things that you've articulated, they have low conversion rates. And right. I think that's the challenge that we've got to right. call out. Um, you know, like uh, cold calling, you called that out, you know, just calling from uh, spreadsheets and buying lists. Uh, you know, going door to door and knocking. And I'm, I'm going to say something provocative here, but I want it to be said in a way that like just the old way that we used face to face meetings is uh, grossly out of style. I mean, I think back in my career over how many times I had face to face meetings that weren't productive. Now we have to make sure that when we do face to face uh, and uh, there's a lot of things that have to line up there. Customers have to have the approval to travel in some cases or be, even be in their office. A yeah. lot of them are working remotely. So yeah. if we want to truly meet them where we are, we have to evolve our approach. Face-to-face -face is super, super important in certain sales motions. And especially, you know, as you're building up to or, you know, celebrating the, you know, the winning of the business, you've got to spend time together in person. Um, but there's, you know, that's where we got to challenge some of these old models is we've got to look at What's different? The landscape's different. The customer's different. We got to meet them differently. Yep. Well, and the customer is the common denominator why it's not working, right? It's it's not because we're not good salespeople or we're not working hard or it's not any of that. It's that the customer is, and the prospect is different. And as you said, Carson, they're more informed and they're also less tolerant. And you combine those two things together and you have a different landscape, well said, that why some of these traditional models are less than effective, right? Whatever, whatever it may be. So let's just kind of go ahead, Brandon. Sorry. Well, I had a question, Carson, when you said some of the, your, some face-to-face -face meetings are not productive. What do you mean by that? What, what makes a, a meeting like that not productive? Not as productive as they once were. I look back and I, I'd say like as sellers, we should challenge ourselves. I mean, I remember amazingly the ability that I used to have to go see three, four, five, six customers in person. You know, you just get in the car in the morning, you go visit, you, you know, you plot your day, you might grab some lunch or maybe some jerky and, and uh, you know, you just, you, you, you know, you're a road warrior. Right. Um, but were all those meetings as productive as they uh, could be in today's world? Absolutely not. Um, I mean, you think about some of the meetings that you'd have in person that you really achieve or accomplish nothing. Or you think about some of the meetings that you had where maybe you realized midstream that you really needed this other resource. So you had to schedule a next date, which might be two, three weeks out where you're going to bring in somebody else. That meeting may get punted or postponed or whatever it is. Nowadays, I can have a virtual meeting with anybody at any time, no geographical barriers, and I can add 
other resources in real time if they're available from anywhere in the mm-hmm. world. So I, I just think about how we've we've shed that old skin um, face to face as it stands is still the best way to meet with someone. However, it's not always the best way to meet with them to, a, you know, to move the ball down the field or to, you know, especially when you compare and contrast with some of these old meetings that you, looking back, you really didn't achieve much or you couldn't achieve much yeah. based on the landscape. Yeah. We, we have a, we have a customer that is a manufacturer and their model pre COVID was all their sales reps were on a plane and they were in a city and they were going, like you just said, meeting in person, meeting in person, meeting. And that was their motion. Right. And a lot of, some of them were prospects, some of them were existing customers. Well, they, you know, now that quote unquote COVID's passed, they want to repeat that, but their customers won't won't take the meetings because Mm -hmm. they're like, well, why can't we just meet on zoom? Well, because we're going to, it's like, and it's a productivity. You know, if you go spend an in-person meeting, let's say if, you know, it's at least 90 minutes blocked out of your schedule, probably longer to do that versus in Zoom meeting that might be 45 minutes or 30 minutes to accomplish some of the same things. So the, again, going back to tolerance, right? The customer's tolerance for just, you know, or acceptance of what is time effective is not there as well. Then you add in the other things you said, Carson, maybe they're working from home. They're not there. They don't even know they may or may not be there. So they don't want to commit, you know, all that type of thing. It just, it makes that motion of the in-person process very uh, ineffective. Yeah, I mean, think about it this way: like, there's a lot of sellers that I know that are, you know, basically glorified employees of the customers that they support. I mean, they right. walked the halls, they were so in the right. trenches, uh, in the field, water cooler talk. Now they go into these customer organizations and they're like ghost towns in those offices. You know, you're seeing more and more of these offices being phased out. Um, and look, I, I'm not a fan of that approach in a perfect society, perfect world. I'd still be doing face to face with every one of my customers sure. every day. But that's not realistic. Right. Mm-hmm. I mean, we're now in a day and age where, you know, we're going to support global uh, customer presences. And uh, it's not feasible to just travel if, you know, fly around the world when I can just jump on a virtual call and uh, transact like that. It, it's, it's amazing to watch this this shift. And I think that's the, you know, where the, we, we've got to really challenge some of these sales models because we talk a lot on this show about, you know, getting the at bats, but also inc- increasing the conversion rates and the batting average. And uh, a lot of these virtual tools, as we bend to where the customer is, that's how these are being built. You know, things that give us more insight, more intel, better way to show up with value at wherever they are in the buying cycle. And I think that's the key. We're going to continue to see this. I mean, I can't believe if you'd have told me three, four years ago that I'd be able to close uh, deals of the magnitude that my team and I closed that without ever meeting or shaking hands with some of these folks, I would have not believed you, but yeah. now it's going to become more and more commonplace. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So let's go back. Well, actually let's, let's get a few comments. Cause I think there's some really good comments here. Um, Brandon, uh, Brandon says that social selling takes less time, especially if you're using fist bump. <laughs> I don't know. What See, do you think? What do you think? I think Brandon? I am paying people. Maybe yeah. I am. I don't know. What the heck's going on? Carson, we're we're obviously didn't get the memo here on how with how we set up the audience. I love um, it. Nikki, welcome. She says she's um loves these sessions, which is great. Great to have you. And let's see what else. Um Brandon is yeah. also gonna go grab some jerky. So yeah, I do. I do miss the days of grabbing jerky and apple and a bottle of uh, coconut water and hit the road again. But, but I think this, you know, as John says here, this is a good point, right? Video makes it easy for companies to cancel travel yeah. or scrutinize travel a lot more. Whereas before, it was like almost like it was just a, it was just part of the job. You had to travel, so you know, it wasn't scrutinized. Now it's scrutinized even more and more, and even in person meetings are are, are scrutinized. And let's see what else. And here's another good point. Go ahead. Go ahead. Well, as I say, Cups, Cups, our guest last week, and I can't remember if he said it on the show or said it before, but he he was telling me he had to face to face. He was on a plane going somewhere, which was a surprise. And then uh, when he got there, the security guards had to open the door and let him in. Yeah. And they went into the conference room. The, the who they were meeting with met him at the same time for the meeting. They went into the room. 
they had their meeting and they walked out and the guard locked the door again. Like it's just not an easy motion for companies to have face to face anyway. Yeah. It's just, it's just a bit clumsy, right. And, yeah. and a lot more friction. So I want to just hit on a couple of these comments before they get lost here. But I think, um, I think Nikki brings up a really good point here as well is that virtual meetings makes sticking to agendas and time limits easier. So, you know, you can end off, whereas a lot of times when you're in person, it starts late, you end up here, oh, I have to go in and pretty soon it just, it starts spreading a lot faster. So a 45 minute can be an hour and 15 minutes before what you're actually doing. And I think buyers like that too, right? I mean, a Zoom is whatever, it's an hour long, you have pretty defined time, but when you're in person, all the other variables can turns it into an hour and a half, an hour and 45 minutes, and that's their time that yep. they can't get back. Yeah. And I agree with, with uh, Mark here, of course, it's like everything depends upon what you're selling, right? Probably not every deal can be done on virtual or Carson, but it's certainly happening more and more. And I also want to address this question that, that Brian brought up, because it kind of goes back to one of the first things we were saying is, is the lead magnet dead? Um, so I'm not a huge fan of saying dead, but let's go back and look at that mm -hmm. first sales motion of, hey, I have a lead magnet. Somebody downloads my white paper or my you know, fills out a form on my website. And then all of a sudden now I'm going to follow up and, and start, you know, as a salesperson or a prospecting BDR, SDR, try and get that meeting. So Brandon, you and I were looking at some stats and talking about some stats about this yesterday. So basically the number, and the, again, this is going to vary by industry and vary by product, but generally for every one, it's 1% 1 of the people who will take a lead magnet or download a lead magnet or, or sign up for a ma lead magnet will then even take a meeting. Okay. That's one out of a hundred. And then one out of 10 of those people that take a meeting become a, a, uh, opportunity, like a real opportunity, a real sales opportunity. So what that says is for every thousand lead magnet downloads that you get, you might get one of those that turn into an opportunity. Now, think about the work that's going on with those other 999 people that downloaded the lead magnet that your sales team is doing, that you're doing, or whatever, that is not turning into anything to get that one that actually may turn it. And that's not even a close. That's an opportunity that's mm -hmm. there. Well, and you're, you also need to um, play into it. What did it take to get those 100 lead magnets downloaded? What was yeah. the expense and... Yeah and everything that went involved with getting those hundred, how many people did you have to advertise to and your yep. SEO and all that? I mean, it's, it's, it's a heavy lift. Well, and I the think. problem, the problem is right. Is that why does this, why is this so ineffective? Is a lot of time the lead magnet is a piece of content that somebody wants because it's a good piece of content, but it doesn't mean that they have any intent to buy your product or any interest in your product. But we make no. that leap that because Brandon, you downloaded the white paper on, three steps to social selling that, you know, they immediately want to buy something related to social selling or whatever. It's, it's, yeah. it's a big, big leap that gets going. When I told the story and I know Carson, you have something you want to add to this, but um, you know, I love downloading Salesforce content, but I'm not going to be a, I'm not a prospect for Salesforce. I'm not going to be a client, but every time I download something, I, in fact, I, I joke around now, I look at my watch and start timing it they call me within a minute okay. and I used to just ignore it. But then the poor person, they call me like 15 times and go to my voicemail. And now I get to the point, just, I think it's Salesforce and I feel bad for, for the person that's got to call me as I answer phone, say, I'm just downloading content. Like I love your research. That's it. You know, you may want to note that. So you guys don't waste your time with me, but every single time I download something, my phone rings. And I think part of challenging some of these old models is finding the way to fit them into the current playing field. Um, you know, I coach and train social selling for the company where I work, right? Um, and we have marketing leads that come in and I was a seller, you know, you reach out to one, two, five, 10, 15 of these folks, you're probably gonna go over the room. But what I've tried to do is apply strategy around these leads. You know, if these are people that have opted into being contacted 
okay, I can secure that and I can build community around these lists. You know, today I have thousands of such folks that have opted into marketing that have downloaded some type of content. And because of that, I have that stored. And that's my newsletter list. That's my webinar invitation list. And by sending those thousands of invitations or, you know, those quality touches once a month, twice a month, um, that's how I secure people to join and, and you know, follow these newsletter and, and webinar content. Um, I'll get hundreds of attendees for these live webinars. Uh, that's a phenomenal lead generation that puts that list to work, but it challenges the traditional sales model. Because when I think about traditional sales models, I think about, you know, the old hammering the phone mentality, the whole more, more, more dials. Um, I think we have to challenge everything about it from the model itself to how it was instituted. And a lot of that falls on sales leadership. We've got to set the tone. We've got to be clear with strategy and how we put this stuff out there. We can't just be spreadsheet jockeys and, and see it, you know, manage from a CRM. Yeah. And, that, and that, I think what I heard you say too, that I like is just because somebody filled out a form or downloaded something or even attended a webinar, your mindset isn't lead, at least not lead right now. It's there's some sort of an interest, but let me put them in another list and keep inviting them to more webinars or share other pieces of content and I, what I like about that, Carson, is we're aligning with the mindset of the buyer, right? One of the, one of the things that we have in our top 10 mindsets of modern sellers is that you can't control the buyer journey, but you can influence it. And I think you just gave a great illustration of how we can influence the buyer journey. And that's not necessarily just a marketing motion, right? That goes into sellers' hands. Because then when you're the one doing the invitation, when you're seeing, okay, these people have been going into these webinars and some of your social post content references it and talks about it, adds additional value to it, what you're doing is you're influencing the lens in which they look at you as being this source of information, this information giver, this value giver, and, and you're staying involved in their buying journey, but you're not trying to control it. No, and I think it's awesome, right? What you're saying, Carson. Carson, I can't hear Tom. Can you? We lost Tom for a second. Yeah, there. we did lose Tom. How about now? There Tom, you are. It's crystal clear. Okay. Um, I thought Brandon gave me the ax or something for a second. You know, that's, you, have, you have the power today, Tom. You know, this is a funny tactic, and I have to throw this out briefly. That's one of the other things about virtual meetings is that if you need to cut off one of your colleagues, you hit their mute. <laughs> right. <laughs> I've seen it done. Yeah. Right. Um, Has it been done to you, though, Carson? That's the question. No. Not, no. not as far as he knows. <laughs> so, so anyway, what I was saying about reframing, right, you were – you. If we reframe, this goes back to Brian's question, is a lead magnet dead? No, the lead magnet's not dead. But if you reframe how you use the lead magnet to build community, build relationships, maybe even as a foundation to go connect with them, right? If they download the lead magnet, then use that as the opportunity to start the social prospecting process, you know? There's a, but it's not, hey, do you want to buy my stuff, which is what you're getting from Salesforce, Brandon. You're getting... Right. Hey, how can I get you on a demo? Come on, let's go. You, you must be a candidate for, for Salesforce because you downloaded some research paper that was there. So and it's Brandon said this perfectly because the message in all that is as a seller, instead of just dialing every time you get one of those lead magnet hits, think of a way to deliver value to those folks repeatedly and That's consistently right. over time to entice mm -hmm. them to want to take a meeting with you. Yeah. And again, create the demand and do the through the process. The problem, mm -hmm. I think, and this is what we're up against, right? You said it, Brand or uh, Carson, is management wants the KPIs. How many phone calls did you have? How many demos did you get? How many? And we have to change that mindset to great. How many people did we add to potentially add to our community? How many healthy connections did we make? How many of those things? Because those are the real assets versus the 999 people that didn't want to have a, a demo, right? And go forward. And we've done nothing with, you know, Brandon, when you've downloaded from Salesforce, do you feel like you're part of the community somewhere? Are you getting other nurturing things? No, you're just waiting for, they're waiting for you to do the next mm -hmm. one. They're going to jump on you for the next one. That's there. Yeah. 
So, and I, and I think let's let's kind of go to the second scenario, which is the cold cold calling and the cold email and the and the cold piece on there. So I, I let's let's stay in the theme of sort of re restructuring or repurposing or re looking at these. You know, Carson Brandon, do you have any immediate ideas on how those you know that scenario of the cold? You know, I think the social prospecting is a great example of that, but um, how that can be reframed. Go for it, Carson. I just think it's amazing to look at some of these because I, I keep going back to the conversion rates. You know, I ran a call center years ago. And I mean, some of the markets that we would call, I mean, our conversion rates were like 0.01%. And it wasn't because we had bad sellers. Right. It was because, you know, we were calling just these lackluster leads in dead markets that like the field sellers couldn't sell. So they gave them to our call center to dial on. And, you know, don't get me wrong. I mean, we were actually very successful. We exceeded goal. We grew substantially. Um, but I mean, that that was the challenge. And we had some campaigns that were like 10, 15 percent conversion rates that were like our Glen Gary leads. Right. Movie reference. Um, but uh, no, I mean, it's I think that's where we got to challenge that from a cold calling perspective. Right. Cold calling looks different. The concept is still always going to be around, just like everything that we've been discussing up to this point on today's show. Mm -hmm. The concept is still sound. Do I still want to have a live conversation uh, with somebody? Yes. Um, the beauty of doing some of the virtual sessions right now, too, is like, for instance, if you've got a customer that you really want to get a meeting with, or maybe that's been ghosting you or hasn't been taking meetings, you can now do the proactive virtual meeting invitation that just goes out to their calendar. And I've seen this work many, many times where you can get the meeting, they'll accept, or maybe they'll propose a new time uh, based on you know your attempt to influence in that way. Cold calling looks different, uh, but we really have to challenge the old conversion rates. And it's based on the fundamentals, right? We had no intel. You know, A lot of the old cold calls we were making, we had very little intelligence around it. Or if you mm -hmm. wanted to build intelligence around it, you had to do 10, 15, 20, 30 minutes of research just to make a call that the likelihood of them even picking up was very low. So you're just in a very low probability for success environment. Now you're armed with all this intel. Your means by which you can cold call are much more diversified. And your ability to show up with value, thanks to all of the different tools that are out there, mm -hmm. is heightened. So you have to capitalize on that. Well, and Brandon, this ties right back to social prospecting, right? So yeah. as, as an alternative. Yeah. And I think, I mean, that's one of the big advantages of social is that it can be a combination of one to many, you publish something, but then you can also, and one to many could be you go comment on other people's posts where your buyers tend to be, or they've already commented and liked something and you come behind them and you comment. It's really the ability for us to change the lens in which a buyer looks at us, right? If we just do cold outreach of any type, we do cold outreach. As I say, we, you know, you, sm you smell like a salesperson. It's pure cold outreach. The expectation, I was talking to someone earlier today, they were, you know, in leadership. I said, if you get a cold outreach, whether it's a cold connection request or a cold call, um, what are your perceptions? And he said, oh, it's usually this, this or that. And they were all three different types of salespeople. Like that was his gut instinct from a cold outreach. So, and, and I love, I've adopted this, Carson. I always give you credit is how can we increase our probability of success with a cold call, well, what if they see us in another environment and they see us in social and we're commenting, we're sharing content, we comment on others, they're getting notifications that show, hey, this person, they, they commented on a post that I liked or they commented on a, a post that I commented on, they commented on my post and then some sort of, and I won't even call it cold at that point, it's more of a warm outreach because they're familiar with you. Like we move ourselves with our activity from being cold and unknown to becoming someone who's warm, recognized uh, before. And then you get that increase in cold calls being returned. You get an increase in emails being responded to. You get an increase in connection requests being accepted because we've changed the lens in which they're looking at us. I think that is just one of the huge opportunities and advantages 
that um, we have with all these different digital tools is Carson says, you know, you put them in a list and you invite them to a webinar. Well, like, and then I'll say that like our show has opened up a lot of doors for me without me having to be such a cold caller because they see the content that we produce. They can listen to things that we talk about. They have an idea of where we're coming from before any sort of conversation. It, it just lays that foundation and it changes the view of being, this person's going to try and sell me something versus I like the, what this person talks about. I'd like to learn more and maybe give them time for a call. Well, and what you're saying is in your infamous circle of trust, right, Brandon, is mm -hmm. by doing the things you described, I inherently may end up in that circle of trust before I reach out. And so therefore, a probability of a engagement conversation goes way up, way up versus if I'm yeah. outside that circle of trust, that probability is very, very, very low. Yeah, so absolutely. all we're trying to do is work our way into that circle of trust. And then once we're in that circle of trust, it gives us all kinds of options of how we actually go through. Again, these are not how our traditional sales is, is measured, right? It's more measured how many phone calls, how many meetings, all of that. But yet, if we were measuring a bit more about how many people are coming into our circle of trust, that's a much bigger asset, right? I mean, mm -hmm. think about that. And I think that's what you're saying, Carson, is you're, you know, all the things you're doing is you're trying to put more and more people into that circle. And you're trying to get into more circles of trust, basically, which is a big, big, big asset. Yeah, so, for sure. I know we have a couple comments. We let's start with Mark's here, and then we'll work back because there's a couple other good ones I want to hit on here. Yeah, I want to hit on Mark's comment. It's great. Uh, you know, it, look, the bottom line is meet your customer where they are, but also find a diversified way by which to have quality touches with them. You know, if you've got your customer that spends all their time in the field or on the shop floor, like Mark calls out, you got to meet them there, right? You have to. That is top priority. But are there other ways that I can consistently touch them, build community, uh, you know, invite them to things, influence, offer value through different social channels? Absolutely. You know, I think one of the things that we'd be remiss uh, to not point out today is, uh, you know, just how things have changed from sales has given us the capability to develop uh, these new skills, you know, developing a social selling strategy, um, you know, having a strong digital presence, um, you know, understanding customer needs and preferences and how we can kind of forge that relationship better. And then also what it can do from a personal brand perspective, because a lot of these things did not even exist in the old traditional sales model. So look at all the benefits from that perspective, but still at the heart of it is you've got to have customer obsession at the heart of whatever you're, whatever it is you're doing. Yeah. And, and to piggyback on that, Carson, which well said, um, we always had personal brands. We just called it a reputation before, right? It's if, if the person's on the, the floor, the shop floor or something else, if we have a reputation, other people have talked about us. Um, we have a show, we have episodic content. They're consuming it because they may not spend all day behind a desk, but if they're in business, they are spending some time on LinkedIn or other social channels. And like, and I know our show, we, we primarily are focused on LinkedIn, but we repurpose content on TikTok and Instagram and Facebook. Why? Because some of our buyers, they may not be as active on LinkedIn, but maybe they're more active on Facebook for personal reasons, but we can still get our snippets in front of them on Facebook and they start learning about us. So we're using all these digital channels as opportunities to expand our influence be in front of the people that we want to talk to, to increase the probability that that person that's on the shop floor is going to carve out time to meet with us, whether it's virtual, it's face-to-face, -face, it's using all that content to really, whether we call it a personal brand or a reputation, but have something ahead of us because buyers control their journey. And as they're consuming content, reading, listening, people on the podcast, you're probably driving somewhere right now, listening to the podcast because there's something here that intrigued you. Um, we're getting that information in front of them through all these different modern digital channels that we didn't have access to before. Well, and I'll give you a, a real life example, right? My software company, our primary market are manufacturers and industrial distributors. So these are people that are out on shop floors, they're out driving a truck, they're out at job sites, they're doing all those things. 
the number of people that when we go to a show that will come up to us and go, hey, I saw your show or I saw you on the show or I really like that is like mind boggling because you would think these would be the last people that are seen at a desk listening to a live show. But to your point, Brandon, either through the podcast, when they're driving, when they're on Facebook, whatever, somewhere they've seen it and and remembered it. Right. And it stood out from those from those situations. And it yeah. completely changes the it, our, 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 right out. Even if you've never met them before, never. It changes the tone right out of the gate. Right. Even whether yeah. they're not inter- even if they're not interested in what you're selling, it doesn't matter. But we've had this happen where they'll bring somebody over. Hey, I, you know, they refer you start to build the referral network. So the community or the ecosystem that Carson, you were talking about in the beginning, as you build that. Again, there's this residual benefit that comes over and over and over from building that residual from residual benefit. But yes, we can't eliminate mm-hmm. face-to-face meetings, but we can influence the process of what we do on that. And let's see. Let me hit Nikki's question before we, or Nikki's comment, which I thought was really good. She has a top 10 list for us. And we like top 10 lists. That's um, right. Like we're on Letterman. It's right. That's right. So just a few advantages of virtual meetings, location independence, instant connectivity and exclusivity, cost effective, increased productivity, ability to record meetings and virtual meeting software. Well done. And there's a couple more, but all of those are very, very true. Right. Things yeah. that really, really add to that. Oh, two more, Brandon. She yeah. had globalization and data storage. Yeah. Or the Thanks, Nikki. That's good. Yeah. And I think, um, Put Sudhir's uh, comment on there, and Carson, I love your your take on this. Yeah, it, it, this is a great question. So there are a lot of prospects that are not active on social media, but since this is a social selling show, I'm going to actually talk about how you can continue to. We've talked in past episodes, create that groundswell of influence, and sometimes that can lead to that connection uh, that you ultimately seek. Now. Yes, there are still tried and true old ways to try to connect with folks. I mean, let's say they're not active on social media. I can still do a search for the name, maybe find some method by which I can connect with the person. Um, I can take a educated guess, often what the email address may be based on the domain of that organization. And of course, I'm going to try to do that. But again, I mean, you're, you're trying to go one for one here. These are low probability activities oftentimes. Mm-hmm. If I reach out to a senior executive in one of my uh, healthcare organizations that my team supports, and I just take a, an educated guess at their email address, I often do not get a reply. However, if I'm able to find and connect with some of the other influencers via social or other methods, uh, warm recommendation and referral from people that maybe I am able to connect with. Um, Ultimately, you're just looking for that domino to fall, right? So Mm -hmm. you ultimately want to kind of swarm the influencers of that influencer. And ultimately, one of them or multiple of them can give you that introduction that you seek. I've done this many, many times. Mm -hmm. It's a great question, but it's a way that you can actually utilize social selling to get to your ultimate outcome, uh, even if it isn't a straight line. Well, and and well, so I was going to say, go back and listen to our episode number 24. I think that was the week you were off, Carson, uh, celebrating your dad's birthday, is our title that week was, what if our prospects are not on social, what do we do? So uh, Brandon and I talked a a whole episode about that. So go check it out. It's episode number 24. Um, Plus, there's a good couple of dad jokes on there, I think. There are good dad jokes. And I would say also- That episode was much higher. Because oh yeah yeah no it, it, that, that you're right about that the bar was way higher on episode 24. In, yeah, in, in, in but, but don't but don't tell no one tell Carson that it was better when he wasn't here. That yeah. hurt his feelings. Yeah, it's okay. Yeah, I think the other thing is um, number one, I would say if they're not active on social media, I worry about that as a sweeping comment. Um, maybe they're not as active on LinkedIn. Um, maybe you can find them in other social media channels. And we, we've talked about that on the other episode. But here's where I also think is utilizing our modern tools, our digital tools. And Tom, you and I have talked about this um, a lot, about the value of episodic content. And oh, Carson, you do this with, with your salesman on fire and your lives. A lot of it has to do with the message that we send to them. So if we have to go to email or even we go to a phone call, what if that was more depositing value? Like, 
hey, I, we had this episode on XYZ. I thought you'd be really um, interested in it because of these reasons. Here's the, you know, here's the link to it. Or even on a, on a voice uh, message, we can say, you know, go to whatever. Um, there's an episode there. It still gives us the medium to demonstrate adding value. Right. It's not a call of going, hey, we do X, Y, Z. We think it'd be valuable for you. Give me a call back. Buyers don't respond to that as well anymore unless the timing's right. But when we we can send those messages and say, come take a look at this, read this, listen to that, um, make it fun. Hey, you know, like most of us, I'm sure you got drive time. Here's a 30 minute episode on X, Y, Z. Love to hear what you think about it for these reasons. We're still getting touches in. We're still building that rapport. We're demonstrating giving value. And again, we're changing the lens that they're not looking at us as just a pure salesperson. If we want to be a trusted advisor, we want to be seen as a trusted advisor. We have to provide trusted advice. And that's a way that we can do it, even if they're not on social media. Yep, well said. And yeah, we go deep on that on episode 24. So definitely... Definitely check it out. So as we wrap up here today, I'm going to try and see if I can summarize this. Why, what is broken with traditional sales models? Well, what's broken is, right, the customer is different. The buyer is different. And because the buyer is different, the traditional sales models are very ineffective. And that's the simplicity of it, right? It's not because, again, we said in the beginning that we're not good salespeople or we're not hard workers or whatever the case may be, it's the buyer is different. Mm -hmm. The buyer's expectations are different. The buyer's intelligence and, and knowledge that they have is way more than it's ever been. Their tolerance is lower for sales pitches and pitch slaps and all of that. So then all of the things that we do that align with what the buyer doesn't want become less effective. And that is the reason that traditional sales models are broken. And we talk a lot about the modern seller being the modern seller revolves around the buyer. You know, everything we talk about about modern selling or social selling revolves around the buyer and then building the relate what you would want and we want as a buyer. It's no different. It's just applying that. And the only thing we're up against is the fact that the KPIs, the management models, the, you know, the, the things that were the statistics, the things that we're evaluating success with sales is really what's broken because that's what's driving the behavior of the past. If we can change the metrics and the KPIs and Carson to finish up, I'd love to hear, you know, are you seeing that even within Microsoft as a big company? Are you seeing a acceptance of looking at different KPIs and different things on the sales front? And I know, you know, Brandon, you had a call with another big company today. Are you seeing that, that switch or is it still got a ways to go to, to move through that? Well, knowing that I'm live and that there may be colleagues watching. Um, no, I look, yeah, <laughs> no overall, right. hypothetically, hypothetically, it's important. You know, you have to embrace a buyer centric sales culture. Good That's point. the bottom line. So mm -hmm. great sales leaders are doing that and they're challenging some of these old norms of this is the way that it is or this is the way that it has to be, because at the heart of it has to be earning the today's buyers business. So mm -hmm. yes, I'm absolutely seeing that. Uh, the KPIs are definitely shifting. It's a lot more about meaningful connections and conversations as opposed as it is to just hammering the phones and making dials, selling widgets. Um, absolutely. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's promising. And, yeah. And Carson, I love the word you used is earn, right? Earn. Um, we talk about that in the the top 10 mindsets of modern sellers. It's about earning conversations, not getting conversations. And if that mindset really sinks in and we absorb it, it will naturally start to change our behavior with buyers. All right. Well, I think we've solved the problem. What is broken with traditional sales models? It's, it's in I feel right like this here. One came full circle. Right. This one was really like we came to a solid conclusion. A solid conclusion. We don't need to talk about it again. It's done. Drop the mic. We're through. So. Although, Carson, I, I want to challenge you to come up with another movie reference that we can use because Glenn Gary and Ross, it's too easy. It's repetitive. I, I know you got one in there. 
That's fair. You know, this one actually, I, I kept thinking throughout this of the, uh, the movie, The Social Network. And the reason why is because, you know, obviously it was about the advent of Facebook, right? But it really, it challenged the old norms of connecting. That was the whole mm -hmm. impetus and wherewithal for its creation. And I think that's what we're moving away from is the old models that, that worked in those times of connecting and meeting with people and doing business and having relationships. But today, everything is fundamentally seismically shifted because of, you know, the, the day and age and the tech that we, that we live amongst. So um, that's what was the kind of like the, the prevalent theme in my brain as we were having these discussions was I, I kept going back to like the social network and that kind of being the dawn of this mm -hmm. era we find ourselves in. And the great sellers are at the pulse of their buyer. Yeah. That's it. As usual, Carson, that was brilliant. That was a great, great analogy bringing in. And it, and it, I mean, you summed it up perfectly. It's bottom line is buyers have changed in the way that we are engaging in communities has changed. And as sellers, we have to adjust and be in the community in order to earn the conversations. I like it. Powerful. All right. Yeah. Great job, everybody. Thank you for all the great comments today and everybody who attended live. Um, and, uh, have a good week. And Carson, this was fun. Thanks for all the comments in the chat. And until next time, happy social selling. Thanks everyone.